Boa tarde a todos. Obrigada por terem vindo a mais esta sessão do nosso ciclo de seminários uh, Repensar os Arquivos, desta vez com o professor Jeffrey L. e um comentário do professor Lauriano Macedo. As apresentações vão ser feitas pelos colegas Abel e Filipe, portanto eu, eu não, não vou ficar aqui mais. Uh, só para agradecer e dizer que, então, para o mês que vem, cá nos encontraremos outra vez. So, I was uh, giving everybody the welcome and uh, I was explaining uh, that uh, you will speak and then Laureano and that the, the session will be conducted by these two colleagues. And that next month we will we'll finish the, the seminar, the cycle with uh, Charles Jurgens. So, I think all went very well and I thank you all and most of all I thank the speakers and I, to, I thank the organizers. Boa tarde a todos. Eu vou falar em português para explicar muito rapidamente o seminário, o ciclo de seminários, que tem como título Rethinking the Archives, Repensar os Arquivos. Tem como finalidade colocar os arquivos entendidos como construtos sociais no centro do debate para analisar e caracterizar as suas origens, funções, estruturas, materialidades e reutilizações na longa duração bem como para aquilatar o impacto presente da transição digital na construção da memória da comunidade. Neste espaço de debate inter e multidisciplinar que decorre entre outubro de 2023 e abril de 2024, pretendemos promover o um encontro entre a arquivística histórica, a história, a ciência da informação e os archival studies, no sentido de contribuir para o enriquecimento da reflexão teórica e metodológica em torno do conceito de arquivo e das suas relações com diversas áreas do saber, procurando colmatar uma necessidade que se faz sentir no panorama científico nacional. Ao ritmo de uma sessão por mês, são trazidos à discussão por investigadores de renome internacional diversas subtemáticas previamente selecionadas pelos coordenadores do CIPO. A análise e comentários de cada sessão são efetuados por investigadores séniores do panorama português, também com projeção internacional, no sentido de contribuir para encurtar as fronteiras que possam subsistir no panorama científico global. Os textos resultantes das seis sessões serão publicados em 2024 num e-book sujeito a revisão por pares, sob o título do seminário. No final deste ciclo de debates, em julho de 2024, realizar-se-á também o Vinculum Project Archival Colloquium, cuja organização já está a decorrer. Muito obrigado a todos por terem vindo. Eu passo a palavra à Filipe. Boa tarde a todos, mais uma vez obrigada por terem vindo. We'll make a brief presentation of uh, you two uh, in Portuguese. Um, vamos começar por apresentar muito brevemente os oradores de hoje. O professor Geoffrey O já é amplamente conhecido, é um renomado especialista na área dos arquivos e da gestão documental, é investigador sénior honorário da University College London, uh, onde lecionou durante vários anos. Uh, e dirigiu também programas de estudos nestas áreas. Tem também uma vasta experiência, além da docência, também como arquivista e como consultor de gestão documental de outras instituições britânicas e também estrangeiras. Tem publicado muito sobre arquivos, sobre gestão documental e tem dado um especial contributo às reflexões conceituais em torno uh, dos arquivos, dos documentos e da informação. E este tema que o traz cá hoje para refletir sobre o conceito de arquivo, documentação e informação, ou documentos e informação, e teremos o comentário do professor Laudiano Macedo, que também é uma arquivista uh, reconhecida a nível nacional, que tem uma vasta experiência uh, em arquivos de administração pública, em especial da região autónoma da Madeira. A sua formação na área das ciências da documentação, da informação e também da gestão e administração pública realizou-se em diversas universidades, Universidade de Lisboa, Universidade Autónoma de Lisboa e Universidade de Coimbra. Uh, também tem exercido funções de docência na Universidade Autónoma de Lisboa e também é investidor integrado do Centro de Estudos Clássicos da Universidade de Lisboa. Portanto, vamos passar a palavra aos oradores. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you for your warm welcome. Um, it really is a great pleasure to be here today, and I, I feel so honored to be invited to share some thoughts with you. Um, I've been asked to talk about three key terms of our profession, archives, records, and information. And these terms give rise, I think, to a number of questions that I would like to address. What are the concepts that underlie them? How might they be related? 
How are the terms used in different languages? And how are they understood in different linguistic cultures? Is there still a place for distinct understandings of archives and records in a world increasingly dominated by ideas about information? Well, in attempting to answer these questions, my talk will be in five parts. I will begin with the terms themselves. Each of them has a diverse range of meanings, and I will examine how the three words have been used in the past, as well as how they are understood today. I will then consider how ideas about information intersect with our comprehension of records and archives. And finally, I will offer some concluding thoughts. So let me start with the word archives. This word, or its equivalent, exists in almost every language in Europe. I expect that everyone here today knows that its origins lie in ancient Greece, where the word archaeon was used to refer to a place where laws, decrees, accounts, and title deeds were brought together, stored, and made available for consultation. The Greek word archaeon gave, gave rise to the Latin archivo, which in turn was the origin of archivo in Portuguese, archive in English, and similar words in other modern European languages. In the classical era, archives were essentially repositories. But as time passed, however, the word acquired a wider range of meanings. The material holdings of repositories also came to be labeled as archives. And the pioneers of archival literature in the late 19th and early 20th centuries all offered definitions of archives as materials rather than places or institutions. As far as I know, this extension of meaning has occurred in almost every European language. If I speak in French of les archives, or in Italian of an archivio, it isn't immediately obvious whether I'm referring to a place, to the materials held in that place, or indeed to both. And in recent years, of course, the range of meaning of archives has undergone several further shifts. Historically, in every language and every country where the word was used, it carried an association with public acts or with writings kept by government bodies. But more recently, it has become commonplace to accept that archives can also include non-written materials and that they can be maintained by businesses, non-profit organizations, families, and individual persons, as well as government institutions. A further extension occurred when the word archive began to be used to denote the totality of documentary materials created or received by a single organization, family, or person irrespective of where those materials were stored. From this perspective, an archive is a whole made up of parts. It can be moved from place to place. Its ownership can be divided with different parts of the archive dispersed among different individuals, institutions, or nation states. But conceptually, it can still be identified as a single archive. Particularly in English speaking countries in the 20th century, some people have wanted to limit the scope of archives to materials designated for long term uh, retention or those judged to have historical or cultural value or those that have been formally entrusted to an archival repository. But in many countries 
of continental Europe, there is a history of resistance to limitations of this kind. And even in Anglophone cultures, many commentators insist that these restrictions are unduly confining and that the status of an archive does not depend on its historical merit, its long-term preservation, or its custodial arrangements. As I'm sure we all know, debates have also arisen about the extent to which archives in the sense of materials or writings can be described as natural or organic accumulations. In the 20th century, archivists generally insisted that the growth of an archive was a natural process. But today, this assumption seems open to dispute. Individual items within an archive may perhaps be said to have come into existence more or less naturally as life or business progressed. But decisions about which items were to be kept and how they would be organized and presented to users are based on fallible human judgment. And in parallel with this, many archivists have moved away from conceptions of archives as rigidly arranged entities, recognizing that no single ordering can capture the multiple relationships of archival materials or serve the multiple needs of their diverse users. Archivists have begun to seek more flexible ways of addressing context and provenance. In recent years, the shift to understanding archives as materials rather than institutions has also encouraged scholars to examine non-traditional or non-Western ways of maintaining archives or preserving memories. And in seeking to redefine archives to accommodate these alternative perspectives, some scholars have argued that archives should be reconceptualized as assemblages of any objects deemed significant by those who assemble them. Others affirm that the term archives embraces not only collections of material objects, but also a range of memory related practices in non-material forms. <clears throat> Understandings of archives have been further complicated by computer scientists, cultural theorists, and others who have appropriated the word archives, or more usually the word archive in the singular, for their own purposes. In computer science, an archive can be a backup copy, a set of files or data sets stored offline, or part, a part of a website that displays superseded content. Digital humanities scholars, artists, audiovisual curators, and digital librarians have also adopted the word and use it to describe collections that have little resemblance to archives as archivists have traditionally understood them. A body of literature, for example or a collection of soundtracks drawn from a variety of sources may be described as an archive. In the view of one recent cultural commentator, an archive in its widest sense is any collection of data brought together to resist its being lost to memory. And an American literary scholar has taken this further and argues that all artifacts form one vast archive, the tangible residue of the activities of humanity. Cultural theorists influenced by the works of Michel Foucault and Jacques Derrida have rendered the concept of the archive into a metaphor for almost any protocol used for the control of knowledge or the exercise of hegemony. Today, as cultural historian Julieta Singh has observed, 
archive can mean almost anything. So how might we respond to these developments? Mm -hmm. Many archivists have been unenthusiastic about them. Some have simply ignored them. Some have vociferously objected to the appropriation of a key concept of our discipline by scholars in other fields. Some have pointed out that most writings about the archive by scholars of literature, art, cultural theory, show little awareness of archival science as a discipline with an extensive literature of its own. Others, however, have adopted some of the ideas put forward by non-archivists and have incorporated notions about archives from other disciplines into their own thinking. Rightly or wrongly, perceptions of archives as an inclusive concept, embracing a wider range of materials than archivists traditionally believed, are rapidly gaining popularity among archival scholars. And I think we can confidently predict that in the years ahead, further new conceptualizations of archives will continue to appear both within the professional community of archivists and outside it. Well, in summarizing the changing uh, uses of the word archives, I have been treading territory that is familiar to almost every archivist and archival scholar. However, the early history of the word record is less well known, I think, perhaps partly because the word is specific to English language discourse and has no precise equivalent in most other languages. Even in England, however, the words evolving uses have not been thoroughly researched until very recently. Until the latter part of the 20th century, both the term and the concept of record were confined to England and to other countries such as the United States that have legal and administrative systems with English origins. Although many archivists in non-English speaking countries have begun to adopt the word record in recent decades, it still, I think, remains distinctive of the English language. The word does, of course, have roots in Latin. It derives, ultimately, from the Latin verb recordare, to remember, widely used in ancient Roman literature. And in modern languages other than English, words derived from recordare still connote remembrance. Their meanings do not correspond to record as the term is now understood in Anglophone cultures. And this distinctive understanding of record originated with the common lawyers of 12th century England who invented the Latin word recordum and used it to indicate a judge's oral testimony of judgments made in the proceedings of a court. After all methods of recalling judicial business began to be superseded by writing in the, the late 12th and, and more especially the 13th century, the term recordum, later anglicized as record, came to be applied to their written successors. Between the 16th and the 19th centuries, concepts of record in England gradually shifted from an exclusive association with courts of law to a perception that records could be made and kept across a much wider array of contexts. By 1700, many people accepted that the term could be employed to describe the writings of a range of church and state institutions. Some of the later developments in the meanings attributed to record 
paralleled the changes in understandings of archives that I discussed earlier in this talk. And in particular, an extension of the concept of record beyond the writings of corporate bodies to embrace those of private individuals had become commonplace by, I guess, the early 20th century. Most English archivists of that era, such as Sir Hilary Jenkinson, instinctively saw records as the product or products of official or institutional activities. But many of them also used the word to refer to personal and family papers or other unofficial writings. And other new concepts of record emerged in the 20th century after the birth of what was initially called records administration, a term soon replaced by records management in the United States in the 1940s. The pioneers of records management associated the word record with organizational business needs and sought to confine archives to materials kept for historical or cultural purposes. And these usages, as I'm sure we all know, were promoted in the writings of Theodore Schellenberg and led to the famous dogfight between Schellenberg and, and Jenkinson, who insisted that the words records and archives were practically synonyms and who castigated Schellenberg for advocating a point of view that, in Jenkinson's opinion, was both arbitrary and dangerous. A more recent development in English language discourse is an acknowledgement that records need not be in the physical form of documents. This, I think, is very largely a consequence of the digital revolution, with its frequent emphasis on data rather than on documents in the sense of fixed units of, of narrative text. In the early days of computing, as Australian archivist Adrian Cunningham has noted, archivists tended to be a bit standoffish about data because data in database systems are often subject to constant updating. They lack stability. And this led many archivists in the late 20th century to regard data management as someone else's concern. In the 21st century, however, most archivists have come to recognize that records can be, and increasingly are, created using structured data and database applications. The relationship of documents to data has remained a matter of debate. Some commentators have wanted to demarcate a clear boundary between them. Some have argued that the universe of data subsumes documents, and others, though perhaps in, in smaller numbers, have turned this argument on its head and have claimed that the definition of document embraces what computer scientists call data. Well, whatever view we take of these disagreements, it seems indisputable that the growth of database technologies has occasioned some shifts in our conceptualizations of what a record might be. And just as it has been widely accepted in recent years that archives can include non-written materials, it has also come to be acknowledged that a record need not be dependent on the use of writing. Few archivists would now dispute that a record can, and frequently does, consist of one or more visual images or combinations of images and written texts. Video and audio technolo technologies can also be used to create records. A few years ago, I made a survey of 
professional literature and collected more than 50 definitions of record from, uh, from recent decades. The definitions were very varied, but almost all of them insisted that records could be created and maintained in any media. Despite this apparent acceptance of diversity, however, uh, it is evident that even today, expansive concepts remain in competition with more restrictive modes of thought. Some 21st century commentators want to limit the term records to items deliberately designed or selected for medium-term or long-term retention, while others affirm that ephemeral items, casual communications, and items that survive only through happenstance can also qualify as records. Some professionals in our field continue to limit their perception of records to organizational settings and insist that records are confined to items captured and managed within an organization's formal control system. While others, including many proponents of records continuum theories, seek an inclusive view that extends the concept of records to non-textual materials kept by marginalized communities and to the traditions, songs, dances, and rituals of indigenous cultures across the world. In my own writings, I have claimed that records and record keeping practices can be identified in early societies such as Mesopotamia, Pharaonic Egypt, and Shang Dynasty China. On more than one occasion, I have chosen to write about the kipu, the knotted cord device used by the administrators of the Inca Empire, and to interpret kipus as records and archives maintained in a society where writing was absent. And indeed, the identification of kipus as archives dates back as far as the work of the Italian scholar Baldassare Bonifacio in the 17th century, diverse and inclusive conceptualizations are not wholly new. The polysemic nature of the word archives has often been accepted without demur, but today or uh, within our profession, it's used to designate both institutions and materials is I think largely taken for granted and seems to cause few difficulties in everyday practice. Disquiet is largely restricted to the appropriation of the word by bicultural theorists and computer technologists and others outside the profession. But different understandings of the word record have often led to acrimonious debate within the profession, at least in, in English speaking countries. Most professionals agree that records are made and accrued in the course of activities that take place in the world and that they are closely connected with those activities. But beyond this, consensus is often lacking. Does a record come into existence when an inscription is made? When it is communicated or used in the course of activity? Or only when someone designates or selects it for preservation. Some practitioners insist that records are defined by management procedures. Others, more convincingly in my opinion, argue that they are distinguished by their associations with actions and events. Further questions ensue. Is a record essentially an object or might it more appropriately be characterized as a relationship between object and event? If it has object characteristics, is it always an individual item? Or can a multiplicity of items constitute a single record? 
Should inquiries about objects and physical items now be abandoned in the light of newer understandings that records can be intangible? All these questions and others like them can give rise to considerable disagreement. And academic commentators also disagree about whether records must be fixed and secured against change or alteration, as archivists have traditionally believed, or whether we live in a world where fixity is a chimera and records are always fluid. Each of these views has its advocates. And there often seems to be a gulf of, of mutual incomprehension between the parties to the debate. Further tensions arise because in Anglophone countries, record is a word used in everyday speech as well as specialist discourse. It has to bear many differing nuances. Although the word record is still widely perceived as characteristic of English speaking societies, there are indications that it is now becoming a global term in our discipline. Most notably, it has been adopted by several Francophone archivists. In 2006, for example, Marie-Anne Chabin and Françoise Rattel published an article entitled L'approche française du records management. In many countries, however, the use of the English word has been avoided and attempts have been made to find a translation using words, words such as document or registre, documentos or registros. Please correct me if I am wrong, but I believe that this has been the usual practice in Portugal in recent years. The organizers of today's seminar kindly sent me an invitation in English and asked me to talk on the theme archives, records, and information. But I observed that when the title of my talk was rendered into Portuguese, it became Archivos, Documentos e Informação. I pronounced that correctly. I hope you will pardon the inadequacies of my pronunciation there. What I want to emphasize, however, a shift here that I noticed from records in English to documentos in Portuguese. And I began to give some thought to questions of translation. It occurred to me that there might perhaps be an expectation that if I spoke to you about the English concept of records, my remarks would be equally applicable to the Portuguese concept of documentos but I am not convinced that this is wholly correct. Besides the concept of records, there is of course a concept of documents in the English language. I have already briefly mentioned the Anglophone discourse about documents and data. But in view of our time constraints, I don't propose to explore the English concept of documents in detail today. I must emphasize, however, that the concept of documents in English is not the same as the concept of records. In an article that I wrote in 2011, I analyzed the two concepts at some length and concluded that documents and records in English follow different logics. Documents, I argued, are generally defined by their format, Unlike records, they are almost always perceived as entities at item level. In some circumstances, I affirmed a single document may constitute a record, but in others, a record might be part of a document or a set of documents. Physical or digital objects that are not in documentary format can also be records. Some English speaking archivists might well interpret these concepts differently, but the English concept of documents certainly allows an interpretation along these lines. 
Now, I'm not qualified to speak about the concept of documentos in Portuguese, and I don't know how much diversity of interpretation it allows, or how far my characterization of documents in English might apply to it. I strongly suspect, however, that the Portuguese concept of documentos is not identical either to the English concept of documents or to the English concept of records. And difficulties of this kind aren't limited to translations between English and Portuguese. When the international standard ISO 30300 was recently translated into Norwegian, Records management, the English phrase records management, was rendered by the Norwegian term documentations for valtning. But record was translated as registrer. Well, sadly, my Norwegian pronunciation is no better than my pronunciation of Portuguese, but I hope it is good enough for you to observe that the Norwegians invoked words equivalent both to document and to register in order to resolve the challenges of, of translation. Yet in English, neither document nor register carries precisely the same connotations as record. There is, of course, some overlap, quite a lot of overlap, I guess, in the significance of all these words. But ultimately, the translation is misleading. Looking across to non-European cultures, we can see that an Inca Kipu, for example, is a record. It is far from clear that it can be called a document or a register in the English senses of these words. The Slovenian language apparently has five words, five different words that can be translated as record, but all of them are said to have slightly different meanings. And I've been told that in German, there are at least eight such words. And I would be hugely surprised if any of them carries precisely the same nuances as the word record in English. Eric Kettler wrote in 1997 that many terms in professional archival terminology are only understandable in another language when one knows the cultural, legal, historical, and sometimes political background of the term. I believe that Kettler was right. When we face what Michel Duchamp called La Tour de Babel Archivistique, we must accept that linguistic usages and their associated concepts are always shaped by the forces of local culture. And even in non-Anglophone countries that have adopted the English word record, the word is now almost certainly acquiring further local nuances that differ from the nuances that it bears in English. Right, after that excursion into the field of comparative linguistics, I now come to the third member of our trio. How and where might the concept of information fit into our understandings of archives and records? In older writings about archives, information was hardly mentioned, barely mentioned. But today, it has a high public profile, and many archivists identify themselves as information professionals. Archives, we are told, are part of an information multiverse, and archival studies is said to be a subfield of information studies. Some commentators go further and claim that in a digital era, distinctions between archives and information are irrelevant, and that the two disciplines are converging 
or should converge into a single profession called information management. Similar trends can be observed among records managers. In an age when the importance of information is constantly promoted, many, perhaps most, records managers have enthusiastically adopted the notion that they are information professionals. Both in the United Kingdom and in Australia, the divisions of the National Archives that were responsible for records management have been rebranded as coordinators of information management and have rewritten their published guidance in a way that emphasizes the role of information and minimizes the use of the word record. Other records managers, especially in North America, have embraced the concept of information governance, defined by one of its proponents as the holistic coordinated approach to information. Some see records management as an essential building block of information governance. But for others, it seems that notions of records management as a distinct practice are now redundant. Some professional associations such as Armour International in the United States seem to have abandoned the word record almost entirely presumably on the grounds that records and their management have been superseded by newer practices in the world of information. Like archivists, records managers have often struggled to maintain their profile in the workplace. And many of them have been tempted to rebrand their discipline in the hope that a new label will enhance their visibility and allow their voices to be heard in the corridors of power. Although information has a, a glamour that records and archives frequently appear to lack, the precise meaning or meanings of information are not easy to pin down. As information scientist Christopher Fox observed, Information appears to be ubiquitous. It appears to be everywhere in the modern world, but no one seems to know exactly what information is. Records professionals who have embraced the term have seldom troubled to investigate it in depth, and their assumptions about the ways in which information and records might be connected have often been very disparate. Some have chosen to see records as a type of information. Others think that records contain information. And the third view is that information becomes a record when it has evidentiary value or when measures are taken to ensure its rigorous management. And the fourth view is that distinct perceptions of records are no longer needed because the universe of information has subsumed them. Well, although the discordance of these opinions is, is rarely remarked in our professional literature, the view that information becomes a record when it is managed in a special way doesn't seem easily reconcilable with the opinion that the governance of information is superseding the management of records. The view that records are a distinct type of information seems incompatible with the notion that differences between records and information are vanishing. As Adrian Cunningham has noted, in adopting ideas derived from discourses about information, many of us seem happy to rebrand ourselves as professionals serving a concept that we have made little, if any, effort to understand. Well, about 10 years ago, I set out to explore some of the possible meanings of the word information 
and to investigate the conceptual relationships, real or supposed, between information and records. Most of my findings found their way into my book, Records, Information and Data, which was published in 2018. The book also aimed to study the place of record making and record keeping in today's information culture. In my talk this afternoon, I can do no more than attempt to explain why I thought these were important questions and to summarize my conclusions. In the time at my disposal, I won't be able to examine every aspect of these topics or give you a full account of my investigations. And for a more complete discussion, I, I, I must refer you to the book. Like record, the word information has antecedents in ancient Latin and a pedigree, uh, at least in the English language, that reaches back to the Middle Ages. Early dictionaries explained information as an act of informing or as intelligence given. And for many centuries, it was assumed that information, whatever it was, was abstract and intangible. But more recently, it has often been perceived as a material entity, a physical or digital object or set of objects that can be measured, stored, and systematically managed. But this newer understanding is by no means universally accepted. The word information can bear many different meanings. Several observers have commented that there are as many definitions of information as there are writers on the topic. In English, information is always singular. But in, another, in a number of other European languages, including, I believe, Portuguese, its counterparts have a plural as well as a singular form. Thus, in many parts of the world, information is apparently a countable phenomenon. In English-speaking countries, it is not. Whatever the precise implications of this may be, it offers I think a clear indication that understandings of information vary not only across time, but also across different linguistic cultures. One popular approach in recent years has been to define information in relation to data. Information is frequently described as data that have been concentrated, processed, or, or improved. But data, in their turn, have often been defined as the raw material of information, thus introducing a circularity of argument that leads us nowhere. Writings by computer scientists lack agreement on what is meant by the word data. It seems uncertain, for example, whether data are deemed to be meaningful or whether they are simply clusters of binary signals on, on digital media. As I tentatively suggested earlier in this talk, data is an elusive term. Its definition is just as fluid as definitions of information. Information, whatever it may be, often appears inert. People choose to do things, sometimes very important things, in the light of the information they possess or acquire, but the information itself does nothing at all. Commentators writing from a modernist or rationalist perspective often associate information with facts or supposed facts about the world. Information tells us how the world is, how the world was at some moment in the past, or how it is supposed to have been. But the information we possess about the world seems largely distinct from the world it describes. Records, by way of contrast, are not passive but active. At the moment of their creation, they are linked 
to the performance of action. And in their later lives, they continue to have active social roles. Consider, for example, an email in which I write, I apologize to someone I have offended. When I dispatch this email, I do not merely send information about an apology. I perform the act of apologizing. Writing and acting are intimately connected. And other records work in a similar way. They pose questions, issue instructions, make promises and agreements, or confer rights of ownership. They are not pieces of information, but agents by which actions are performed. Of course, many records are created to make statements about the world. They report on events that have taken place or decisions that have been reached. But to make a statement is also to perform an act. And as numerous cultural critics have reminded us in recent years, statements about the world are not autonomous truths. Some may be false, others may be ambiguous. All are contingent on the actors who make them and the contexts in which they are made. So records are always closely associated with human behavior. Record making is not merely a matter of documenting or describing activities or events external to the recording process. Humans perform activities through records, and these activities are essential to our systems of rights, duties, commitments, and obligations. Records enable people to conduct business and communicate with others in the course of their daily lives, and they play a powerful role in the construction of our social world. We may want to ask how records achieve these results. I have argued that they function as representations of activities. A representation is something that stands or is believed to stand for something else. And records stand for things that happen in the world. But they don't merely describe actions undertaken at earlier moments of time. Records also participate in actions and help to constitute them. We can perform an action, such as making a statement, giving an instruction, or entering into a contract by representing ourselves as performing it. As management scientist Mark Berg remarked, the creation of the representation is involved in the very event that it represents. Activities and events are perceived to have endings in time, but records have persistence. They have the capacity to remain available after the activities or events they represent have ceased. And because they are persistent representations, records can participate not only in creating and conferring rights, duties and obligations, but also in sustaining them after the moment of their initial creation. Suppose, for example, that I make a promise. The act of making the promise occurs today, but the conventions of Western societies insist that the obligation of the promise endures until it is fulfilled. But because records, too, remain in existence after their moments of issuance, we can use them to underpin the continuation of promises, contracts, rights, and responsibilities over time. And the ability of records to create rights and obligations and to represent their creation persistently places record making and record keeping at the foundation of social life. If we understand records in this way, we may ask where concepts of information fit into the picture. I have argued that information is not a material entity, but an intangible affordance that can be garnered both from records and from a diversity of other sources. 
It is one of the many affordances that records offer, and others that often figure in archival discourse include evidence, senses of identity, and reinforcement of memory. Like evidence, information is a product of interpretation, rather than a commodity that resides in a record and merely awaits extraction by a user. Photographic records supply a useful example. Rather than claiming that information is embedded within photographs, it seems more congruent to argue that we can elicit information when we examine them. And such information can extend beyond the subjects depicted in the photographs. We may, for instance, obtain information about photographic techniques or about photographers' preferences for particular locations. And textual records seem equally versatile. A file of correspondence may provide users with information about items of business or about social networks or about styles of writing and about much else besides. So a user can employ records to acquire information, not only about the activities that the records represent, but also about topics that may not be explicit in the record's content. Different users interpret records in different ways and conjure different information from them. <laughs> I am very doubtful about suggestions that records comprise information about their subject matter, but can also be employed to garner other information. Instead, my preferred perspective sees records as complex instruments of social interaction and information as an affordance that they can supply. Records have a distinctive and vital role in performing as well as representing human activities. As Eric Ketelar says, they do not contain information, but they make it possible. Our minds can derive information from using records intelligently. And finally, some concluding thoughts. You will, I'm sure, have noticed that in discussing concepts of information in relation to our discipline, I've chosen to speak about connections between information and records rather than those between information and archives. And to some degree, this has allowed me to sidestep the thorny issue of how records and archives relate. But nevertheless, in emphasizing the active character of records, their relationships to activities and events, and the roles they play in society, I have sought to raise issues that are also very relevant to our understanding of archives. And in particular, I see common ground between my thinking on these subjects and the views expressed in 2015 by German scholar Marcus Friedrich when he spoke of the need for those of us who study archives to shift our focus from archives as institutions to archives as arenas for and elements of human behavior. Some commentators on my work have tried to smuggle in ideas that, that, that reinstate information as a central component of records. Dutch archivist Franz Schmidt, for example, has claimed that my characterization of records as socially active representations fails, in his view, to specify what the representation consists of. And Schmidt affirms that, in his view, such representations consist of information. I disagree. I would argue that historically they consisted simply of objects or marks on objects which human minds interpreted as representations of phenomena in the wider world. Today, Besides written characters, they also include 
digital signals that can be read by a computer. But unlike Schmidt, I don't believe that ideas about information are needed to explain their structure. That said, I accept that in my writings about records, I am merely expounding understandings that I personally have found helpful. I welcome others who have chosen to adopt or adapt my ideas, but I acknowledge that my way of looking at these questions is not the only possible way. I know, for example, that many archivists with backgrounds in librarianship or information science instinctively want to see records and archives in informational terms. It seems so that in the years ahead, there will continue to be different conceptualizations of what a record might be. Nevertheless, I would urge archivists not to overlook the consequences of the growing tendency to emphasize information rather than records. Some may ask why it matters. Why can't we stop worrying about terminology and simply concentrate on doing our daily work? My response is that this is not merely a topic for academic speculation. It has significant practical implications. In today's workplaces, information is a powerful concept. And advocacy of our professional concerns is often difficult and using the language of information can appear extremely effective in our dealings with colleagues and senior managers. But downplaying the distinctiveness of records and archives also brings dangers. It leads to confusion about the purposes that records serve and the vital roles they fulfill in organizational business and human life. And when archivists speak mainly or only about information, organizational power brokers can easily assume that record keeping has no distinct value that specialist archival skills and practices are unnecessary, or that archival functions can safely be left to information technologists, data analysts, or others who claim information management competencies. I believe that we must continue to promote and affirm the importance of records in the digital era both as instruments of current social action and as bullocks that support our ability to corroborate what was said and done in the past. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I want to express my profound gratitude for the invitation received, extending uh, special thanks to Professor Maria de Lourdes Rosa and her remarkable research theme of the Vinculum project, particularly um, Abel Rodriguez and Filipe Lopes. It is a great honor for me to be here on this day alongside Professor Joffe and to be able to make some comments on his recently heard presentation. The text proves to be extremely rich and thought provoking and I hope to meet the audience expectations by sharing some relevant notes on his, this communication, and I invite you to join me as I, uh, re, uh, as I read through them. The title of the presentation, Archives, Records, and Information, Terms, Concepts, and Relationships Across Linguistics Cultures, highlights the importance of examining the fundamental concepts uh, of archival science and information science from an evolutionary perspective. The proposed, the proposed theme uh, is particularly well suited for someone who has devoted many years to the study of these topics as evidenced by the, his extensive scholarly output. During this presentation, I intend to make references uh, primarily to the most recent books of our speaker, um, Record Making and Record Keeping in Early Societies, published by Routledge in uh, 2021, and Records, Information and Data Exploring the Role and Record Keeping in an Information Culture, 
published by Fancet in 2018. Although various publications worldwide have addressed many of these concepts, there are distinct perceptions about them as highlighted by the speaker himself. However, analyzing these concepts across different linguistic cultures is a particularly challenging exercise as proposed by our speaker, um, speaker, especially when attempting to map all the underlying nuances of thought associated with these concepts. Professor Zia's contribution uh, goes beyond acknowledging the importance of these concepts extending slightly beyond epistemic boundaries. Such a perspective is observable in various scientific communi communities that consider information as the primary object of investigation. But I ask, uh, will it be valid to speak of epistemic communities in archival sciences? Is this concept defensible? Regarding the sciences around records or information, it will be acceptable although I, it may be lack of justification. Thus, Professor Yao's approach consists not only of discussing the evolution of these uh, concepts in distinct section, sections, but also of incorporating others that, in his view, help to specify their relationships, relationships, context of use, and conceptual interdependencies. Similarly, I will seek to contribute by establishing connections with concepts and terms in the Portuguese language, also marked, uh, marked by the passage of time with continuities, disuse, appropriations, and revitalizations. It is evident in your presentation a considerable effort to bring forth the contemporary issues that surround us in all contexts. And you do so in a very clear and admirable manner. Thus, moving on to the commentary itself concerning the section on archives, our speaker discussed the origins and evolution of the concept, concept changes in the perception of archives, the expansion of the definition of the archives, and how debates and perceptions about archives have been constructed over time. The paper uh, highlights the main trends from perspectives oriented towards inclusion and respect for cultural diversity, reappropriations or appropriations, reactions from the archival community and future trends. It is well known that the ancient Greek word archaeon is the indisputable origin of the term archives that has populated various languages in almost all treatises and dissertations on archives, we find etymological analysis from the Dutch Gerardos Ioannes Vossius, Baldassare Bonifacio, Albertino Barisson, Gabriel Naudet, Asaver Fritsch, and many other German, Italian, and French scholars of the 17th and 18th centuries. Nevertheless, the term archivum was not as common among the Romans. In fact, more frequently used were tabularium due to its metonymic relationship with the support tabulae, as evident in Roman epigraphy and literature, or scrinium. In the Greek world, we know that the public repository, repository as meton in Athens, but other denominations coexisted, such as grammatophilakin, cartophilakin, and Gadzophilakion, mm. the latter from the Gadzai, a mixed Hellenic Semitic etymology, meaning repository or treasure associated with the ancient city of Gaza, now unfortunate, unfortunately a devastate, devastated territory. According to Karl von Beheim's dissertation, briefly titled Dissertatio de Archeois, published in 1722, it suggests a possible city of archives and treasure, the city of Gaza. The idea of treasure associated with archives is present in French as Trésor de Chartes, or Tesauros Cartanum. In Portugal, the Torre do Tombo was also known as the Tower of the Treasure, according to Azevedo in the beginning of the 20th century. These terms were not only uh, associated with the idea of the archive as a place, incorporating the title of Margaret, Margareta Silva's uh, 
um, work uh, of Arquivo e o Lugar, the Archive and the Place, but they also refer to the professional, custos, which lead us to the archive as a place of custody, or the counterpart in Greek, phylax. However, uh, we cannot expect that the archives and repositories as a place of custody, stewardship and preservation of records of, the, of these ancient civilizations operated in the same way as we understand them today. As astutely pointed out by Professor Yon in his book, Record Making and Record Keeping in Early Societies, a stance with which I agree, uh, caution should be exercised when attempting to associate contemporary archival management concepts with those used by ancient civilizations. Although uh, our knowledge of these collections is owed to the work of archaeologists and experts studying specific ancient civilizations, they often not only mistakenly categorize these collections as either archives or libraries, but also occasionally employ archival terminology in a less critical manner to explain the management practices of these records from distant pasts. This aspect touches upon what our speaker has cautioned that the concept of archives has evolved considerably. From the idea of repository, as mentioned earlier, a place, an institution, to the level hierarchical representation, encompassing archives not only from the public and private universe, but also in terms of the nature and support becoming increasingly diverse. Professor Yeos further notes that many Western perspectives on archives in the 20th century, with an emphasis on English and American tradition, are beginning to be challenged and the efforts are being made to emphasize alternative approaches. Concepts, as our speaker uh, refers, around provenance and context are indeed not exclusive to archival science, as they share the same concepts with museology, law, library information science, computer science, visual analytics, digi digital humanities, and certainly anthropology, ethnology, archaeology, genetics, art, and other scientific disciplines. In addition to this, it is also mentioned uh, that the concept of the archive has been expanded across various epistemic domains. <coughs> Sorry. In computer science, an archive can be a backup as exemplified by our speaker. In the domain of visual arts, the archive and its Derridean opposite, an archive, can be, for example, a performative artistic expression materializing in an art installation already an ephemeral man manifestation. Although there is a shift in Portugal in terms of seeking alternative approaches, it indeed occurred quite uh, timidly. Thinking to check uh, some, uh, is it? no. Um, for example, the colonizing Portuguese archives should not be a vexata question or a wicked problem, a kind of wicked problem in the academic and professional community. It means that we have a long way to go. Despite the effort towards standardized archival terminology at the international level, as Duchesne referred to, to in his article, Les Archives dans la Tour de Babel, the current stance tends not to be as prescriptive uh, as, as it was until now, but more descriptive and inclusive in line with postmodern thinking. In any case, in my opinion, a significant part of the terminological instruments available on archives in the Portuguese language tends to focus on operational and technical concepts centered around institutions or entities with some bureaucratic apparatus and very little on new archival concepts, for example, the Derrida and Archive. Allow me to add that in the case of the Portuguese language as a Roman language, it has the concept and term Archivo, However, it has not been frequently used in old and modern Portuguese. Without any intention to, of conducting a philological analysis here, we can compare, for example, in the report of Cristóvão Benavente uh, to the King of Philip I, dated 1583, where the Torre do Tombo is mentioned as Arquivo Real. In the Dictionarium Latino Lusitanicum, published in 1592, 
by the Portuguese humanist Jerónimo Cardoso, the Latin entry Archivum is translated to Portuguese as Cartório dos Tombos. And Tombos do Reino is translated to Latin as Monumenta. We possibly find for the first time in Rafael Bluto in his Vocabulario Português e Latino, published in between uh, 1712 and 1728, the terms Arquivo and Arquivista, with CH, where Arquivo has two meanings, the place where the papers or titles of a family or community are kept, and metaphorically as a memory. That is, the archive as memory, as found in the record continuum model, is nothing new. On the other hand, archivista, archivist, Oscarized dual meaning of someone who is in charge of the archive, I'm translating from the Portuguese freely to English, uh, and in the sense of that Indian who was singing was the archivist of the village. Translating freely uh, from the from the, the, the vocabulary uh, Portuguese Latino. But he's quoting Simão de Vasconcelos' Notícia das Coisas do Brasil, published in 1668. And uh, this text is based on the father Alonso de Ovalle in his Historica Relación del Reino de Chile, published in 1648, where he stated that that Indian was the archivist, or better say, he is the archive of that people introducing here indigenous uh, knowledge into the Portuguese and Spanish language, referring to the notion of oral archives, which for centuries was sought to be rejected and in recent decades has been revalued, but also the notion that by singing, the indigenous person communicates information, associating here the purpose of information, that is, to be communicated. Not records, nor documents, but information communicated orally through memory. We also have in the Bluetooth lexicon, registro or resisto, tombo meaning archive, and cartorios meaning uh, registry offices. Uh, document sets are sometimes represented as uh, monumentos, meaning monuments. In Portuguese royal legislation, tombo, appears more frequently than the word archivo or archive. This leads us to the question to, question to what extent the word archivo was widespread in Portugal throughout the 13th to 17th centuries, or if it corresponds to a late introduction, possibly through scholarly means, likely in the 17th or 18th centuries. In Portugal, although research on archives does not have the same robustness observed among our colleagues in Brazil, we enjoy a significant vitality in this area, it is not worthy that even sharing the same language, there are differences. These differences manifest not only in terminology, where concepts and terms tend to be adopted more by Portuguese-speaking countries than by archival concepts in European Portuguese, but also in the ability to explore archival themes beyond the predominant perspective that is bureaucratic, institutionalist, patrimonialist, and custodial, as indicated by the Portuguese scholars as Fernanda Ribeiro and Armário Malheiro da Silva. Regarding to the record section of your paper, our speaker acknowledged the specificity of this concept and term, which is limited to the English-speaking world. Despite being a global concept incorporated into the terminology of the speciality in various countries. As our speaker clarifies, records derives from the Latin verb recordare, to remember, from which the medieval Latin term recordum originated, undergoing, an out, um, um, undergoing its own evolution of uses in the 16th and 20th centuries. We also inherited the term recordar, recordação, associated with memory in an affective way, but not beyond that. It is now undeniable that the use of the concept and term record has spread and solidified across various record-keeping traditions. The use of this concept has become widespread not only in bureaucratic contexts, but also in terms of typologies and formats. The significant difference lies in the distinction that the, our speaker clearly elucidates between the concepts of records and documents while documents are defined by their formal support, 
records are almost always perceived as entities at the item level. I will refrain from discussing the, user, the usage of other languages, acknowledging my, my limitations. In Romance language, particularly in Portuguese, the term documento, archival document or record, encompasses these two meanings, which tend to be distinguished in the English language. What could possibly explain this? We can say that the Portuguese archival tradition inherited diplomatics just like France, Spain, and Italy extended to its colonies or former colonies. For this reason, I guess that the concept of documento in Romance language, which relies on this diplomatic tradition, does not experience the same distinction as the one observed between records document in the English speaking archival tradition. In the, other, in the other hand, some also translate records as registro, registro from Latin registrum, derived from the verb regerere, meaning to record, which is equally a polysemic concept with many connections to register. Indeed, in terms of diplomatics, registros are also considered documents, and in this sense, they are defined by their formal support. Records, manage, records management, for example, is translated into European Portuguese as gestão de documentos and Brazilian Portuguese as gerenciamento de documentos. Just as record centers is translated as archivos in phase administrativa, cura intermediate archives, in the English speaking context, the archives correspond to what we call arquivo definitivo or historico in European Portuguese or Arquivo Permanente in Brazilian Portuguese, as exemplified above. In the case of Records Continuous, we translate it uh, as Modelo Continuidade Documental, or maintain its original denomination. Adjectivization in many cases helps to delimit the various meanings and context of the term archive in Romance languages. I'm not sure if I have clarify, I help clarify the issue you raised, it, especially regarding the topic proposed to you. As in Portuguese, we sometimes translate record as documento and sometimes as registro, depending on the context. Although there are several terminological texts available in Portuguese uh, on archives, both from here and from Brazil, they all lack updating. As I mentioned before, a descriptive approach supported by scientific literature is preferable to a pres prescriptive one. I don't want to overlook an aspect mentioned by our speaker. It is important to recognize that other archival tradition, as emphasized by Baldassare Bonifacio, based on Gaspar Enns in the Occidentalis Historia, published in 1612, Bonifacio not only brought the Inca quipus to European knowledge, but also discussed Chinese typography, which in Europe was considered a Germanic invention. Undoubtedly, his recent book, Record Making and Record Keeping in Other Societies, with a re which uh, I had the pleasure of producing a publishing a critical review, provides an intriguing analysis of the diverse manifestations of record production in various ancient civilizations. The key question is not how old well this practice is, but rather why this is considered an exclusively human characteristic or to what extent it can be. In the third section, our speaker seeks to problematize the interrelationships between information, archives, and records. I'm not sure, uh, certainly the audience can help clarify, if the perception observed within the English speaking community is the same in other regions regarding the convergence between archives and information into a single profession or scientific discipline. I believe that this convergence is not due to profession, but rather to competencies. In Portugal, I can now say, in the case of Brazil, we see an evolution from the documentation science to the information science. Today, consensual in the academic community of information science in Portugal, I don't know uh, to what extent this dissent is more pronounced among those who are there, who are there to history, but still tend to see archival science as an auxiliary discipline to it. 
where archival science is assumed as an applied discipline of information science, simil similar to library science, museology, and information knowledge management. For example, Brazilian researcher Angélica da Cunha Marques identified three perspectives on the relationship between archival science and information science. There are, first, authors who ignore the historical trajectory of archives and archival science and do not consider it scientifically, citing Le Quadique. Second, authors will conceive archival science as part of information science, exemplified by the Brazilian scholar Pinheiro and Silvia Ribeiro in Portugal. Third, authors will demarcate the autonomy of archival science and recognize to varying degrees its relationships with information science, viewing them as parallel scientific areas, sitting examples like Jardim Fonseca and Araújo from Brazil. We dare to add a fourth variant, those who consider archival science as an autonomous disciplinary field in its own right. EMC Heredia Herrera, Luciano Durante, and uh, Marques da Silva, author, uh, Marques, um, uh, authors of uh, an archival science influenced by diplomatics as well as the professional aspect. As can be seen, the connections between information and the archives are intrinsically linked to the paradigm from which these concepts are analyzed. Here, tendencies emerge that seem to be in conflict, those advocating for change and their resistant counterpart. Currently, there is a preference for information management over records management. Naturally, this implies an, a, discuss, a discussion around the object of archival science, archival science itself. Archives, documents, it's about information, some argue that information is the object of other science. We can also add humankind. Today, unlike the 90s, a science is not defined by its object, but by the perspective with which it approaches that object. Certainly, as our speaker clearly points out, the implications in, this, in the workplace where the figure of the archivist uh, tends to be replaced by an information manager are inextricably linked to the increase and diversification of information technologies in the digital age. However, as observed in the past, our profession has had various denominations, some falling into disuse and others in transformation. It is undeniable that the theoretical, conceptual, and methodological influx of computer science is dominating the discussion in the information science today, as well as there in is, uh, is a predominance of information science focusing on IT of English speaking origin to the detriment of European information science as a social and human science. It is unthinkable nowadays to remain on the sidelines of, the, of this discussion. Indeed, when our speaker points out the trend in the United States with the, the emphasis on information governance and a certain decline or in the use of the word records, information ecosystems have not only diversified, but also become so complex that the record keeping management models are being replaced by data management. In the context of artificial intelligence, it is the data, not the records, that are essential informational units for process automation. It is imperative to reflect on how the production of information without human, human intervention will impact the future utilization of these concepts. In the section four, an exercise is undertaken to relate records to information and data. In addition to the etymological origin, Clearly presented by our speaker, we agree that the use of concept of information in archival treatises is quite rare and it could not be different when the document record is to modern archival science as information is to postmodern archival science. We know that the term information is attested in Jacob von Hamingen's von der Registratur, published in the 1571, which is uh, used in Latin in the margins 
in various sections of the monograph, such as Ad Informatione ed Istruzione and Ad Ratio Informandi. It is indeed interesting the contrast that our speaker establishes between information and records. On the one hand, information can have an inert ex existence, while records are an act active entity representing activities and things that happen in the world and persist over time. Records are complex instruments of social interaction with information being a potentiality they can provide. However, when imbued with meaning and subjected to interpretation, it is no longer the records but the information that is present. What about the data, the data and recent development in generative artificial intelligence and its inability to distinguish between false and true information and without human intervention? Perhaps the perspective of affordance, as suggested by our speaker, should lie in the understanding and critiquing how algorithms are structured to generate records of, of this nature. And a new question from, no question, from data structured by algorithm, do we have records or information? Because it already comes with meaning and it didn't have before. Moving, moving on to the conclusions, our speaker clearly states that he preferred to address the connections and the subtle semantic boundaries between information and records rather than information and archives and avoid delving into the question between records and archives. In my opinion, the discussion between records and archives would not only be an innocuous discussion, but would also contribute to add more noise, given that it's not a problem observed in some Romance languages. Nevertheless, our speaker clearly calls for not minimizing the distinction between records and information, and he's clearly exposed on the danger of reducing their ontological and epistemological relevance. In our Portuguese perspective, records are closer to documents than to information. Many perspectives will coexist around the concepts of records, information and archives, and now data and knowledge as well. This points to the vitality that various epistemic areas beyond information science and archival science, when considered, will attribute to these concepts. But if we were particularly attentive to our surroundings, archives are being replaced by new buzzwords, information centers, knowledge centers, houses of centers of memory, not to mention data centers which a tendency towards hyper specialization. Such modifications are not merely cultural. They often have political, economic motivations in a neo-capitalistic paradigm. The call to attention uh, that our speaker brings can also be applied to our professional and academic community in the Portuguese context. In summary, the speaker's presentation stands as an invaluable contribution, mirroring the significance of his extensive a scientific body of work. His impassionate call prompts us to realign these concepts within our expanding epistemic arenas, which are no longer confined to their exclusivity. Well, thank you uh, for your generosity and of your patience.